oh, first memory was hitchhiking to Middletown and probably seeing Frankie Schneider and I think his car was called a big tuna or something like that, you know? And he was not a very big guy. And I said, wow, that guy really could drive for being a little bitty guy, you know? The 50s and 60s brought about some iconic moments in American history. The Civil Rights Movement, We Landed on the Moon, and Elvis Presley was coined the King of Rock and Roll. Recognizable moments like these also occurred on the racetrack as the stock car was created and racing culture began to take form. So in 1949, as stock car racing was born at Orange County Fair Speedway, where essentially people just took cars that were driving down the street and modified them to go onto the racetrack. They were heavy, uh, nobody cared about weight. Everything was either welded on or bolted on. But they made it work, you know what I mean? Back then, what I remember was all the alcohol and the injectors and the smell of the motors. Back in the 50s, when stock car racing really came on, there were all flathead engines, they were cars with fenders on them. It's like the old drawings of the jalopies. Most of the cars were the pre-war 1930s coupes and sedans, mostly Fords, a few Chevys, and a few Plymouths. The competition began to heat up in 1951 with the introduction of weekly races. Features were created as the main event, and the introduction of a points championship kept the competition steady. Probably about 1949 or 50, when I lived right where the Texas Steakhouse is, right now on 211. Used to sneak across the backfields and watch the convertibles racing back in them days. So I'd watch Middletown, I was probably 14 years old. Ray Brown, Bud Marl, they were the guys to beat. People used to dress up a lot to go to races. I've seen people almost in suit and ties to go to races. It was like an affair. Uh, it was a thing to do, I guess. If you wanted a seat in the grandstand back then, you had to go Friday night and go put a blanket on the seat. And then you'd come in Saturday and your blanket would be up there and nobody would take it. And it was full all the way down to the fourth turn. As a predominantly male sport, Women were not allowed in the pit area. When I first went up there, there was no, no ladies in the pits. It wasn't, wasn't allowed in the pits. Back in the day, women were not allowed in the pits. No, absolutely not. Every driver and owner got two ladies passes, so the ladies went to the stands for free. I was allowed to do anything. So as far as women in racing, I didn't realize that there was it was a thing, like that it, that it mattered. A lot of women involved in it, but they weren't allowed to come in the pits. It was just a different time. Thanks to the speed and power of the stock car, midget racing disappeared in the late 1950s. They had on telephone poles that just said stock car racing. They started at 8.30 at night. The racing was close and a lot more cars. I mean, there was times when I seen a heat race with 20 cars with only two to qualify. So if you made the feature in Middletown, you really did some running. In 1962 began what is now one of the most iconic competitions in the Northeast the Eastern States 100. So everyone was looking to get a big race to close out their year. And in 1962, Larry Granger and the team at Victory Speedway came up with a, a fall classic race and they named it the Eastern States 100. It's the old time race, the last of the races at the end of the season. It draws the most cars, the most people. It, it pays really well. It's one of the most prestigious races in dirt modified racing. That's like the granddaddy of, of dirt modified racing, the most historical race we run. Eastern States is like, you know, the grand finale. 
Frankie Schneider won the first one, actually won the first two. And in 1968, it became a 200 lap race. As the races got bigger, so did the spotlight for the drivers. We draw drivers from all across the spectrum, not just the local guys. It's unique. The stands are absolutely packed. It's one of the biggest races of the, the season. Probably anywhere, probably almost in the country. Growing up in Middletown, it was the race to win. Let's see, in 1965, I think is the first year I went north. We owned a Chevrolet dealership, and Will Kegel had stopped by one, one day. Well, he said, well, get your car ready, and next year, follow me. So he'd come by, and I, I followed him north. One of the first races I got to run when it stopped raining was at Middletown, New York. And I, we rolled in there, and it was an old track. Uh, uh, and it's still an old track. <laughs> In the late 60s, Victory Speedway was renamed Orange County Fair Speedway. And a unique feature was introduced to the fans. In 1967, they built the drive-in area. It's like going to a drive-in theater. You put your radio on and you can hear the announcer. There's not too many places that have a drive-in like Middletown has that has uh, the grounds like Middletown has. Well, the drive-in section wasn't here the first few times that I came up here. And there was a board fence along the back stretch. And I remember a fellow by the name of Billy Kramer drove right through that fence one night that I was here. There was no parking on the back straightaway. And uh, down the back straightaways, uh, if you run off the back straightaways, that's where they threw all the old beer cans and stuff from cleaning up the place. They had a dump over there cars now and then it would go into the dump. They called it one car a beer can special because it always ended up into the beer cans over there. I think it must have, must have been Mr. Ricky going through that fence and then going into the dump. <laughs> I went through, but I, I didn't get quite to the dump. Why, why I should remember that? I don't know, but it was, I guess it was an unusual experience. I don't know. Bud Morrow, he knocked the fence down, but he kept going. He went in at turn three into the dump. Oh, wow, you know, did you see that? He went around and he came back through the fence, back out onto the track and kept on racing. <laughs> and you had uh, the old light poles on the infield. And every now and then somebody would go out through there and knock one of the light poles down. The starter stand was out in the, on the track. It was uh, Tex Enright and he would run out there and wave the flag and then run back behind this wooden fence which didn't seem like very much protection, but nobody could pay attention to that back then. <laughs> Everybody went to Frankie's Sausage Bar. They were a sponsor of Frankie Schneider. The original menu with prices that hung outside of Frankie's. Back then, everything was handwritten, and it hung right up on the wall, and you could get a sausage and pepper for 90 cents. <laughs> In 1968, Ray Martin, who was the announcer at Orange County, he, he wrote a book about the first 50 years at, at Orange County. I remember reading that book when I was, you know, 10 or 12 years old, and uh, it had a lot of history about the track and how it transitioned into what it was in the 60s. Race fan entertainment could not have been greater, as it had to keep up with the competition on the track. From hooves to wheels, midgets to stocks, hobbies to contest, history was being written as we closed the book on the first 50 years at OCFS.